Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship. It's good to see everyone on Reformation Sunday in our final two or three minutes here before the top of the hour. Uh, just a reminder about masks, and I think you know to do that. Thank you for your cooperation there. Perhaps uh, the end is in sight in that regard. And um, in the bulletin insert, in case I forget to mention it earlier, is information about the Magi Family Exchange that we want to have ready to go when the season of Advent begins right after Thanksgiving Day. So if you've been meaning to do that, please fill that out and place it in the offering plates today. Also, uh, pledge cards for 2022, if you've not had a chance to do that, you can place those in the offering plates or hand them to our Commitment Committee Chair, Ricky Cook, if you prefer to do that, or mail them into the office. So it's wonderful to be together on this uh, Reformation Sunday. Uh, some information in the bulletin about that. We hope you'll find helpful and informative, and God bless us in worship.
help is in the name of the Lord. The, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Creator God, you have filled the world with beauty. Open our eyes to behold your gracious hand in all your works, that rejoicing in your whole creation, we may learn to serve you with gladness. For the sake of him by whom all things were made, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In the presence of God and neighbor, let us confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all our offenses and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the, spirit, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs> Peace of Christ be always with you. Amen. A 
cordial welcome to worship, those here in the sanctuary, those joining us on live stream, those who may watch us later in the day or the week from Grace Presbyterian Church, Bartlett, Tennessee, a congregation of the Presbyterian Church USA. We are uh, happy to be observing Reformation Sunday today on, uh, on the day, October 31st, 1517, uh, in which tradition holds at least that Martin Luther posted the 95 theses that began the Protestant Reformation, of which we are a part. Uh, we want to say happy birthday to Susan Stepp, our organist today, and thank uh, Daniel for the beautiful flowers that celebrate that occasion, as well as her music and our music together. We will have a congregational meeting following the postlude today to elect the elders class of 2024. Uh, so you're encouraged, uh, church members certainly, to stay for that. Uh, we gather uh, on Zoom uh, Wednesday mornings for morning prayer at 9.30. We pray by name for all the people on the prayer list, uh, read scripture and sing a hymn. Love to have you join us. If you're not already in the habit, send me an email and we'll put you on the send list. Send list. Uh, and we are all sinners, we know that. So, Reformation questions, Reformation answers. We are learning so much and having great discussions. And, of course, our marvelous teacher, Don McKim, who wrote the book. So, uh, about three more sessions of that to go. Still be glad for you to join us. Game night, trivia night, uh, Friday at 7 o'clock. Next Sunday, All Saints Sunday. Time change also. You get an extra hour next Saturday night or Sunday morning. Um, Pledge cards are available on the tables there, and so if you've not had a chance to do that, and those watching, uh, if you can send those in as we prepare the budget for next year. And the Magi family uh, exchange of, I, you know, it's a really spiritual fellowship, I think, uh, and Jan Vauder is here. You can ask her more questions about that. Great to have uh, that exchange during Advent and Christmas seasons, get to know another family in the church better, pray for one another, and uh, share the the hope and the joy of that season. So uh, let's uh, remember with the children, uh, ringing offering, making a joyful noise to the Lord and for local needs. And uh, Janet. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Gracious Lord, like Nicodemus, we come to the word with many questions. Like the Pharisees, we can be captivated by correctness, intent on right answers. As we turn to your word, Spirit of God, do not let our desire for information dominate our need for transformation. Let us hear the word and be moved to greater faith and obedience. Amen. The epistle reading this morning is Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. But when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God. Join me in the unison reading of Psalm 146 as found in your bulletin. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God 
who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is therein, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers and upholds the orphan and widow, but brings to ruin the way of the wicked. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. The Gospel reading is from the 12th chapter of Mark, beginning at verse 28. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and beside him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one neighbor, one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him 
any question. our hope in life and death Christ alone Christ alone what is our only confidence that our souls to him belong who holds our days within his hand what comes apart from his command and what will keep us to the end the love of christ in which we stand oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing hallelujah now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is his grace and goodness known? in our great redeemer's blood who holds our faith when fears arise who stands above the stormy trial who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore the rock of christ Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Unto the grave, what will we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives, and what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him, there we will rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed and we will feast in endless joy when christ is ours forevermore oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing hallelujah now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and
The Old Testament reading is from the book of Ruth, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the days when judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malan and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malan and Kilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way. For I am too old to have a husband, even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more to her. <clears throat> One thing that is clear <clears throat> about the institution of marriage for almost the entire human family is that it is ended by death. The traditional vows in Christian weddings contain the line, till death do us part. Or in the original 1549 prayer book of Thomas Cranmer, till death us depart. In 40 plus years of being a pastor and a few more years than that of life in general, I have known some widows and a few more widowers who have married within a year or so of the death of their spouse. Eons ago, at summer camp in Kentucky, an older minister who was leading the camp 
and I were sitting talking on the porch one night about 10 o'clock and perhaps thinking he needed to explain himself to me concerning his remarriage a few months after his wife had died, he said, Mike, I was just so lonely. I couldn't stand it. But for many other widows and widowers, law, custom, and even the theology of marriage declaring that marriage ends at death it does not seem to change the emotional attachment that the surviving spouse has for the spouse who has died. And these surviving spouses may also miss him or her terribly, but they have little interest, perhaps no interest whatsoever, in marrying again. Now in today's Old Testament, Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth are all widows who face decisions about what to do with the rest of their lives now that their husbands are gone. Ruth and her husband Elimelech, uh, Naomi and her husband Elimelech had left the town of Bethlehem in the region of Judah due to famine. Now in the Old Testament, scarcity of food is one of the great drivers of relocation, you may notice, and the driver of the plot of some stories. It was because of coming famine that Joseph, having foreseen through his interpretation of the dreams of Pharaoh, rose to prominence in Egypt and ultimately was able to save the lives of his father and his brothers when they left their homes to come to Egypt to find food. And here, famine sends Elimelech and Naomi not west to Egypt, but east to a land called Moab, not very far away, just east of the Dead Sea. Now, Moab was a place with whose people the nations of Israel and Judah had had a checkered history. The Moabites were descendants of Abraham's nephew Lot, and as we are learning, and we'll learn more in future weeks in the adult Sunday school class where we're studying Genesis right now, Lot is not a figure to emulate. Lot's transgressions are contrasted with the better faith of Abraham. And though Abraham was not perfect, he was God's chosen vessel of promise and obedience, and through him the Jews felt peculiarly blessed compared to the nations around them. And so Moab contained a people who were rejected and despised. But famine uh, narrows one's options. So while there was still time, Elimelech and Naomi and their two sons of indeterminate age, according to the story, make their way to Moab where there is food. And they settle there. And they stay there for some time. And Elimelech dies, and evidently Naomi must raise the boys by herself, at least for a time. But then they grow up and marry, and they marry Moabite wives, Orpah and Ruth. And after a time, Malan and Killian die. And so there they are, three women, a mother-in-law, and her two daughters-in-law. Or they might be considered her former daughters-in-law, if you take it as fact that all marriages end with death. I noticed in an obituary in the paper the other day, the survivors who are listed in the death of a certain woman included the woman whose uh, the decedent's son had divorced, and she called her her daughter in love. So if you were Naomi, whether you would still call Orpah and Ruth your daughters-in-law or your daughters-in-love, they were by custom, necessity, affection, any two of those or all three deciding what to do with the rest of their lives. 
And Naomi is ready to go back to Bethlehem because the famine is over. As verse 6 says, the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So Naomi turns toward her home, and Orpah and Ruth go with her. But soon into the journey, Naomi thinks, oh, these younger women have no more reason to go with me. They have no more reason to leave their homeland than I had years ago, except there was a famine. We had no choice, but they have a choice. There's no famine in Moab. And so Naomi tells Orpah and Ruth, go back. Go back to your own mother's house. Uh, blood is thicker than water, as the saying is. And to Naomi, the fact that her sons were these women's husbands is not so relevant now since the men have died. But I think Naomi's heart is breaking as she says this. She is truly, altruistically uh, interested in their well-being, their best futures. They should not accompany their mother-in-law or former mother-in-law, if you will, into what for them will be a strange country. Stay in Moab. Go back to your own families by blood. Stay with your people. Find new husbands here. And Naomi is ready to kiss them both farewell. But they basically both say, no, 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 we're going with you. So Naomi brings out another argument. Well, you cannot wait for me to bear more sons who would become your husbands. You, you cannot expect or wait for me to become your mother-in-law the second time around. And maybe there's even a hint here that Naomi is dissuading Orpah and Ruth, not only from traveling with her to Bethlehem, but also from embracing her God. She says, no, my daughters, it's been far more bitter for me than for you. The hand of the Lord has turned against me, she says, meaning she, Naomi, has lost her husband and two sons. Each of them has only lost a husband. Stay here in pagan Moab. Your gods here could hardly do worse to you than my God has done to me. I have no joy except that of knowing you, but for your own good. Go back. And in response to that plea, Orpah says, Naomi is right. Orpah will stay in Moab. We'll go back to her mother. She will make her life there. A few years ago at a seminar on preaching that I was attending, whose focus was on seeing Bible texts through the eyes of people of other cultures, one of the speakers said that this text falls differently on the ears of some Native Americans than it does for, for us in the majority culture. She says that in the Native American tribe she knew, the speaker at the conference, Orpah is the one in this story who chooses wisely. She sticks with her family, her people, her customs, her faith. Now, I do not think that is the lesson we are supposed to take from this book, but that's what happens with stories. They can be interpreted by different people in different ways to different ends. So Orpah kisses Naomi goodbye, lovingly, it certainly seems. She has gone back home. And now Ruth remains. And what decision will Ruth make? She will stay with Naomi. And in doing so, give us some of the most beautiful lines in the Old Testament. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. So Ruth choosing to go with Naomi 
is like the second calling of Abraham. Ruth is hearing and heeding not only Naomi, to whom she is bound with these bonds of affection, it seems, but beyond that, the God whom Naomi knows, even though this God, whom Ruth will call her God, Naomi says, has dealt bitterly with me. But this God of Naomi, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is Israel's inescapable God. Naomi's inescapable God, the God with whom we have to do, the God whom we worship and serve beyond the ebb and flow of the events of our lives, be they pleasant or bitter. Now this passage from Ruth does not usually fall on Reformation Sunday, but the way the calendar works this year, it does. But I find it fitting, for as we're learning in the Thursday night book group, the first Protestant reformers were inviting people to see and understand God in a new way. And Martin Luther and John Calvin were like many people's Naomi, though I'm not sure that either Luther or Calvin were as personally warm as <laughs> Naomi here. They both seem like kind of tough customers to me. But people were willing to go where they would go, theologically, if not geographically. And their people would become my people, and their God, my God. Like Abraham and like Ruth, they would embark on a journey, the end of which was not in sight. Final destination not clear, many times fraught with danger. But they gave their lives over to a call to a relationship, and to a hope that they sensed would be better than staying where they were. And so one strong legacy of the Protestant Reformation is the line reformed, always being reformed according to the word of God. The God Naomi knows is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the great I Am whom Moses met the God we do not tame, we do not control. But this God is always calling to us. Forsake your sinful ways. Grow in grace. Mature in love. Practice kindness and patience. And in the mystery of the sovereign love and purpose of God, you will find a place like Ruth did. And the, the twist, the surprise twist ending of this little book of Ruth is that Ruth, this woman from Moab, becomes the great-grandmother of King David. But you and I have our place. And it is even more blessed to be the least in the kingdom of God is destiny enough.
believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. O God of majesty, creator and sovereign of all, we thank you for your living word, foreseen and understood, however dimly, by prophets and faithful souls in Israel, incarnate in Jesus Christ, your Son, and spread abroad by the power of your Holy Spirit who illumines our hearts to know you, to follow and serve you, to love you, heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. More and more, make this living word alive for us, that we may conform our lives to its love, abide in its hope, and know its peace. Spread the healing grace of that living word throughout our congregation, the church universal, our community, this nation, and all the world, that violence and injustice may end and true peace prevail. Turn our hearts toward your will for us and rescue us from the idolatries of our culture, from falsehood masquerading as truth, and discord inflamed by leaders who seem not to know your love for all people. Guide us, your living word, to righteousness and mutual affection. We pray silently for the needs of our prayer list and others. Our hearts are thankful for the faithful example of all who have gone before us, and especially those who guided us to the saving knowledge and love of Christ. May we, in our time, be faithful stewards of all that you have entrusted to us. In the name of Christ, we pray, who taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now, henceforth, and evermore. Amen.
so richly blessed with the music today. I'm uh, just moved.